Carrion Slicer, Carrion Piercer, Carrion Phalanx, Star Shower, Stars of Ruin, Swift Glenstone Shard, Comet, Eternal Darkness, Gave of Hyma, Adula's Moonblade, Lusat's Glenstone Staff, Carrion Rego Scepter. Did I miss anything? Oh yeah, let's throw in Glenstone Pebble Ash of War and Moon Veil while we're at it. Why not? Tired of seeing mages run these things? Or are you tired of running the same spells yourself? What if I asked you to make an intelligence-based mage build without any of these and still excel at PvP? Can you do it? Is it even possible? This is the PvP variation of my Night Wielder that, yes, still dual wields Staff of Loss. I know a lot of people were skeptical this build can work in PvP because while the spells are very good in PvE, the projectiles are easily strafed like most other projectile spells. So I'll run you step by step through as to how this build works, and you probably want to listen to all the reasoning behind each part, because there isn't much room for changes for this particular build, since it is very optimized for doing what it's good at. You can add a twist of your own, but you'll be hard pressed to take away any of the things I'm going to present to you here. Without further ado, let's start with the spells. These are the spells I run in the PvE build. For the PvP build, I'm still only using 4 spells. I changed the Rock Sling for Freezing Mist. You're probably shouting at the screen right about now. Why Krite? These all look like low tier spells for PvP, except Terra Magica that can give a decent area control by giving you the damage trait advantage. But how is the rest of these garbage tiered spells going to make a strong build? I'll explain the night sorceries in a second, but first, let's talk about Freezing Mist. On its own, this isn't a very good spell as you would not expect it to apply Frostbite to any enemy that simply dodges out of the way. However, it does combo with my weapon that I'll show you later. For now, what it does is it allows you to create an area that is advantageous for you to fight near and retreat towards. It can buy you precious time and space to drink FP pots. It also works better than Night Maiden's Mist because Night Maiden's Mist damages yourself when you walk through the mist and you often use the mist as defense. It also works much better than the chilling mist ash of war, because the mist from the ash of war only lasts for 5 seconds, whereas the mist from the spell lasts for 15 seconds. We care more about the area control than the bonus frostbite we get from the ash of war. Furthermore, you can charge freezing mist in order to increase its radius, which is a nice bonus when your opponent is playing passively. Finally, this spell doesn't do damage. It doesn't matter if we're casting it with a Staff of Loss instead of another Staff with higher Sorcery Rating. And because it doesn't do damage, it can't be parried. Well yeah, Krait, of course they can't be parried. But your enemy will just parry your Night Sorceries instead, and that's precisely where you're wrong. You see, a property of Night Sorcery is that they can't be parried. You can't parry them with Carrion Retaliation, Thops Barrier, or even Golden Retaliation from the Earth Tree Great Shield. Heck, you can't even suck them into Eternal Darkness. It doesn't work. And no, my friend here isn't missing the parries because you can see him parry a regular spell. In fact, you can even parry an Ambush Shard because it doesn't count as a Night Sorcery and isn't buffed by the Staff of Loss. However, you can suck an ambush shard in with eternal darkness. Go figure. Anyway, let's talk a bit more about night sorceries and their counterparts. I covered a portion in the PvE version of the video, but let's take a look at it even more in depth. The startup frame for the swift glintstone shard is 20, while the startup frame for night shard is 24, which is closer to the glintstone pebbles 26. This obviously makes swift glintstone shard better in terms of frame data. But both the Swift Glenstone Shard and the Night Shard have 10 recovery frames. This is important because of a property they share. They can be casted in mid-air, unlike most other sorceries. And what does this have to do with recovery frames? When you cast either of the sorceries in mid-air, the recovery frame is actually delayed to when you land, as you see here on the screen, with the awkward delay before I can roll after casting Night Shard in mid-air. Being able to jump an attack while still having the same recovery frame means the Night Shard isn't at a disadvantage when kiting away from enemies trying to stick to you. In fact, you can say it actually has an advantage. One thing you might not know about spells is their velocity or speed. 
Nine Shard's projectile is actually as fast as Swift Glenstone Shard, which among the other projectile spells is the fastest. Other projectiles don't come out at their max speed, like Comet and Night Comet increasing from 18 to 25 velocity with an acceleration of 40, which just means how fast they go from 18 to 25. The higher the acceleration, the faster it reaches its max speed. But both Night Shard and Swift Glenstone Shard come out and travel at the same speed of 33. It means that besides startup frame, which is largely irrelevant in a jump attack because your jump attack takes up your startup frames, the one that deals more damage wins since they have the same recovery data and speed. And with that, we move on to the next point. While dual wielding two staff of losses, Night Shard has superior damage over Swift Glenstone Shard. In fact, you can see even at base, their MVs or damage percent aren't far in part. Furthermore, you're using the exact same amount of stamina as a Swift Glenstone Shard and using only two more FP. For the extra damage you're doing, it's very much worth it. Oh yeah, Swift Glenstone Shard does indeed travel a bit further than the Night Shard, but most of the time, you're going to land this move at a closer range than max range anyway. Although the range between these two spells definitely still matters a bit more than Comet versus Night Comet. I've went through Night Comet in my PvE Night Wielder video, but let's still take a quick look. When dual wielding two Staff of Loss, Night Comet is just a superior Comet, except for the range, which doesn't matter much because you won't be expecting to hit at max range most of the time. You usually chain cast this spell after a Night Shard, just like a Comet after a Swift Glenstone Shard. You also went out slightly in terms of FP and stamina costs, despite superior damage. Yes, the Comet deals more poise damage, but if you manage to land either one of these spells, it's typically the damage that matters, because your enemy can always roll away from the next one, even if they get staggered. The main advantage of having much higher damage is to punish your enemy with a single hit. If they cast a spell or a skill with longer animation, you might still only have the window to respond with one cast of one of these skills. Thus. Having much higher damage and efficiency makes punishing with Night Comet incredibly powerful. As for the stats, this is the stat distribution I suggest for RL125. I actually have a Prisoner at 125 and an Astrologer at 150. For this particular build, Prisoner is better for min-maxing that one extra point of stat, but it isn't a big deal. For the 125 version, I would put one more point into Vigor or Mind, and for the 150 version, I would put one more point into mind. The reason why I'm not going for 60 vigor in the 125 build is that Staff of Loss is a backloaded staff, and the damage increase is a better benefit than going for 60 vigor. As for why I'm not lowering vigor more for intelligence, it's because the HP gain instead of damage is a bit better here rather than 50 vigor and 75 intelligence per se, because of the code Uchikatana I'm going to introduce to you soon enough. This is the setup for 150. The 1 point stat difference matters much less for Astrologer versus Prisoner at 150 since the extra point will be going into mind and you have enough FP already. Quickly going through the armor, at RL125, I'm using Malekith's Helm and Knight Calvary's armor. I swapped to Veteran's Gauntlet and Borgold's Griefs for enough poise to reach 61 poise, keeping my two main fashion pieces. At RL150, I traded the Veteran's Gauntlet for Bull Gold's Gauntlet because I have extra points for Endurance for a bit more defensive stats. More importantly, it's because I think the Bull Gold's Gloves actually looks kinda good. The Talismans were greatly changed versus the PvE build, because many of the Talisman I used like the Magic Scorpion Charm and the Dragon Crest Great Shield are nerfed in PvP. My Talisman Guide is almost complete. These are my Talisman choices. The only negotiable one is the Crimson Amber Medallion. You can swap this for something else if you really want to. For the Physic, I'm using Magic Shrouding Crack tier and Crimson Bubble tier. So the big question now is, why Uchikatana? Why not something like the Clayman's Harpoon that's great for mages as the only regular weapon that comes with base magic damage and intelligence scaling? Shouldn't it be better? It has more range too. You might be right when it comes to scaling AR since I'm running high intelligence for this build, but sometimes the most obvious answer is not the best answer. In my case, the Uchikatana is definitely superior 
because of the Ash of War I'm running, Spinning Slash. Spinning Slash is very powerful since it comes out quite quickly and applies multiple hits in a short period of time. This weapon art is amazing at punishing enemies that stick close to you. But the Clayman's Harpoon can also use Spinning Slash. Why the Uchikatana? Well, Ash of War is a kind of worms I don't want to open right now as it is very complicated. So I will get to the main point. Spinning Slash's poise damage is dependent on the weapon type you use. Spears like the Clayman Harpoon only deal 63 poise damage per slash, whereas Katanas like Uchikatana hits for over 133 poise. The maximum poise you can currently have with the full Bull Gold set and the Bull Gold Talisman. This means that if you manage to hit the first strike of Spinning Slash, you are able to true combo into the next part, unless latency is an issue. A cold Uchikatana plus the Spinning Slash allows you to do hefty damage and apply the Frostbite status effect, especially if your opponent already took a dip in your chilling mist. Yes, I know about Clayman's Harpoon plus Glintstone Pebble, or for that matter, any weapon plus Glintstone Pebble has the ridiculous true combo because of the Glintstone Pebble stagger. However, that move, like the Ice Spear, is a straight line move, which you already have two excellent options in the form of Night Sorceries. They do not work as well as the Spinning Slash for keeping better players off you. I know there are going to be other questions, like why not Moon Veil? Well, for one, Moonvale has a slightly higher stat requirement that includes weight. For another, while it has longer range and radius, it doesn't come out quite as fast as Spinning Slash in close range because of the very noticeable sheath animation and sound effect, nor is it able to apply Frostbite. As for why not the longer Nagakiba, the stat requirements are even higher for the Nagakiba, while barely having higher attack than the less invested Uchikatana. I only shaved off 10 points of intelligence here, the rest will be a deficit to mind. As for why not weapons like the Noble Slender Sword, because Straight Sword is another weapon type that also deals 133 plus poise damage with Spinning Slash. Noble Slender is about as long as the Uchikatana, but it is way lower on attack even though it does have slightly lower requirements. But the real final trick is that the Uchikatana looks quite like the Moon Veil. It can be hard for people to distinguish your weapon without seeing the weapon art in action when you're only holding one katana with nothing else to compare to. While they're waiting for you to do the sheath animation, you just spin them to death. As for the majority of the gameplay, you just have to be patient and punish any of the opponent's longer animation moves, or slowly whittle down your enemies with Night Shard. Wear thin their patience and if they charge you, spinning slash them. Both Terra Magica and Chilling Mist are there for different forms of area control. Do not feel pressured you have to stay in them, but rather use them as more bait or deterrence. Sorry this build requires so much explanation. Because of that, I'll only be leaving a few narrated duel clips to keep the video shorter. I'll upload a longer uncut narrated duel video separately that will showcase several different opponents to show how you should play this build in response to different builds, so look forward to it. My discord link is down below, come join if you have any questions you want answered. Also, I've made a Twitch by someone else's request, but I'm not sure enough people are interested. So I'll do some streams that'll probably be build crafting, testing, and duels or whatnot if I manage to reach 300 followers first. Like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell. I hope this build serves you well. A spinning slash to end this fight. Yep, okay. Okay, dual wield magma blades, so it's also a spinning slash, but Curved Swords, they have um, shorter range than my Uchikatana. Plus, if he doesn't have a lot of other incantations because he dual wields, then we have better range. Okay, I'll start with a Freezing Mist just to get some area advantage. Okay, let's just try him out with some Night Shard, see if he responds. Okay, I didn't see that, but you see that trade? One Night Comet for a Lightning Spear, much worth it because nothing trades as well as this build. Dodge, yes, okay. Okay, now we punish with Spinning Slash. Perfect. Even if he had tried his own Spinning Slash, we had more HP. So if we trade one for one, 
will be fine. Okay, one, one thing is I think it's also good to um, lay down your red sign with two staffs so your enemy would think you're a pure sorcerer and when you bust out your Uchi Katana, they would be more surprised because the spinning slash would really combo them. Okay, if the wait time goes on any longer, I'll cut it out. Whoa, what? Okay. I guess to remove any pre-buff or something? Hey! Oh, shoot. I just remembered. I'm still... Hey! My physique is still on the stamina one. From the PvE build. Oh no, that's a mistake. You shouldn't cast our Elden Star. Yeah, well, when people cast a long spell like that, you just punish them with Night Comet and you pretty much win. Well, see you guys next time. That'll be all for this one.